Okay, everybody. Um, welcome to the February presentation for the Sacramento Simpty sector. I uh, want to introduce you to your presenter. Um, we're going to be talking about the audio repercussions uh, and issues in volumetric LED uh, volumes. Um, this is a presentation that Eric did at uh, the Simpty Technical Conference uh, in LA last year that I've personally found fascinating <clears throat> and thought it uh, would be a good topic for us to discuss uh, here in the uh, Sacramento sector. <clears throat> so let me introduce Eric. Eric McNeese is a combination m and &E technologist, a proven problem solver, entrepreneur, educator, uh, helping today and sector tomorrow. Uh, is Moses Engineering's Los Angeles-based Virtual Production Academy instructor. The man knows his stuff. He's a subject matter expert in sound reflection and noise mitigation in volume stages, which is what we're going to be talking about today. He's also a subject matter expert in tools for measuring and correcting acoustical environments in recording studios, mix stages, screening rooms, theaters, etc. He's spearheading awareness and adoption of existing data industry standards within uh, media and entertainment's data center infrastructures to accommodate the technical alignment, interoperability, risk mitigation, and customer service. Uh, he's able to offer cost-effective data infrastructure solutions and previously has been an innovator in nonlinear editing solutions for feature picture editorial. He was the first avid trained NLE techn uh, technician the first to support shared NLE picture editorial storage, the first to install and support a mobile feature cutting room, the first networked NLE support, he supported the first networked NLE support in theaters and has a patented camera direct dailies invention. Uh, the man is very technically competent and uh, a great speaker. I think you'll all really enjoy it. So I'm gonna hand this over to you, Eric. Uh, please Thanks, feel to uh, take us through the presentation. Sure, thank you. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for having me. Um, you know, I hope you find this uh, as interesting as, as I do. So um, how I came to start this study was uh, I joined USC's or University of Southern California's uh, Entertainment Technology Center. Uh, they're sort of the think tank uh, that's sponsored by most of the studios and many of the manufacturers. And they were about to perform their second R&D um, virtual production, production, a uh, short film. And I got involved. And the first time I walked onto a volume stage, I felt great pity for the poor production sound mixer. <laughs> I could hear my footsteps. And then when I clapped in there, it, it really told the story for me. And I asked, how is it that people in the industry are able to, to mitigate this. And I was told that they don't, uh, they don't know how and suggested that maybe I should study it. So I did, so I took it on. And to give you an idea of what that sounds like, I'm going to play for you uh, two hand claps in a traditional sound stage. So this is what it sounds like in a traditional sound stage. Okay, now this is what it sounds like when I clap in the center of a large LED circular volume with a ceiling. Sounds more like a gunshot to me, but... Uh... So understanding that not everyone can appreciate the problem that uh, sound mixers, sound recorders have, I decided to look for technology that might demonstrate what is actually occurring. So using an acoustic uh, camera, an array, some spherical array microphone with five cameras on it, I was able to record what sound looks like when you pop a balloon on a volume stage. So you're gonna see it at thousand frames per second. Oops, let me go back. So this is at a thousand frames per second and everything that you see is 75 dB or hotter. So this is a 360 degree view. You're seeing it from the ceiling, the floor, the sidewalls. 
and again, this is this is pretty hot. Um, slowing it down to a thousand frames per second really makes it visible. Now it looks like it's dead, but it's not. It's going to bounce back, and it continues to do this. So it seems to be an impossible task, but um, talking to people smarter than myself and getting an opportunity to try out different ideas, we found that we were able to mitigate it. So what is the culprit? Well, the culprit is that we are building volume stages, ironically, in a sound stage. So in effect, we're building an echo chamber uh, inside a, a quiet room. And it's because of this desire to capture final pixel or in-camera visual effects, all the emphasis has been on color and lighting and uh, image quality that uh, no attention was really placed on sound. And what I think is missing is that there is a cost benefit when a person, when a production does not capture original dialogue performance. ADR is a very poor substitute for a performance. Sometimes you can't even get the original actor to come in to perform their lines. They have sound alike actors that will come in and replace it. So not only do you get the original performance that the director and the actor work so hard to, to uh, create, but you may not even get the original uh, actor. So there's a financial cost also. ADR is more expensive than capturing it up front. And there's also the creative, you know, this less of a storytelling element. And so um, I think it's worth the effort to not have ADR or zero ADR or ZADR, as I call it. So who's responsible for capturing clean audio? Well, it requires that the production want it. So from a top-down directive where you have the producers and directors uh, demanding that all of the uh, crew work in this direction and everyone working together, then from previous to post, we can capture usable sound. This commitment is easier said than done. It's not a typical scenario in that most productions have three uh, individuals working to capture sound and they're not given often a uh, time to rehearse and they're not part of the conversation, especially in pre-visualization where there are opportunities and I'll discuss that later. And if you're going to ask that your production sound mixer and crew perform the additional labor required to mitigate the sound, then that will come at the cost of the artistry of the production sound mixer. There is storytelling in microphone choice and placement that occurs, and that takes thought and work to make things uh, invisible uh, to the camera. And um, having a mitigationist, uh, a labor uh, laborer whose job it is, is to move that equipment around, that mitigation equipment around, uh, will allow it to happen and still keep the artistry of the sound mixer. So let's start from pre-production, previous techniques. Uh, first thing that happens is that in a previous, if a production sound mixer or acoustician uh, are brought into the pre-visualization process, the production becomes aware of the issue and also becomes aware of the tools that would be implemented to mitigate the sound and that they would also understand that they all have a shared responsibility. In pre-visualization and virtual production, not all productions, unfortunately, perform this, this process where the production is basically built in a virtual environment, in the virtual environment, with virtual sets and sometimes actors, but with a virtual camera, virtual lights. And they're basically uh, creating a prototype or simulated production. Right now, uh, sound isn't introduced at this part of it, and there are no sound tools that are uh, possible to put into this mix today, at least. So right now they're able to build these sets and set up the lighting and whatnot. But, um, and if the sound person were involved in this, they might turn and say, with all those hard surfaces, uh, it's gonna be very reflective. So 
maybe we can find materials that are less reflective or geometry that's more conducive to sound recording. So this is where getting a sound person up front in the previous tech phase phase could help a lot. This is an example of the show that I worked on, uh, Fathead, and this is the production designer's drawing, 3D drawing of what she intended. And we see how close the actual uh, build out is to the uh, previous. And so that's why it's so much more cost effective to have sound involved during the previous rather than um, having them have to deal on the set. So for instance, if sound had been uh, part of the pre-visualization process in this, and then there are reasons why this didn't happen, but maybe they wouldn't have used plastic tarp, maybe they would have used canvas or maybe furniture blankets or something like that. That might have told the same story, but been more acoustically friendly. Um, there might have been some elements that could have been placed in a phone booth too, so that when the actor spoke, it would be uh, a little less reverberant. So uh, these are opportunities that can be supportive of the, the process. The same occurs for the costume designer. So in this show, the costume designer had a mirror ball helmet and design and a plastic bottle. This might have made it very difficult to capture good sound if the actor uh, in the movie, they were uh, yelling a lot. And so that would have made it very difficult to capture a really clean sound. And then they had some of the... Uh, smaller roles wearing a uh, trash can, a metal trash can lid. Uh, you can only imagine how reverberant that would have been. And then you have the pots and pans and then someone walking on paint cans. Uh, it would have been very, very difficult. Having had a conversation ahead of time with the uh, costume designer, he then transformed everything to knitted wear. Everything was absorptive. So that helped in the success of us recording uh, clean dialogue. There's also the problem of unwanted noise on a volume stage. The shape of the stage creates an effect of parabolic microphone. So the opening of the stage captures any sound that's in front and then amplifies it because of its echoing effect. So there's some work to do in that area as well. And this is going to be a video showing you, I did a survey before production came on the set to see if there were any uh, noise generators that I could uh, abate ahead of time. So this is 35 dB and above, uh, which is a whisper. It's equivalent to a whis someone whispering into the actor's mic. And this would have been a fan noise that would have been picked up by an actor's microphone. So seeing this, I was also able to show the uh, vendor uh, what was occurring and they then looked at their equipment and this is what it was. They found that what the fan noise was coming from a uh, piece of equipment that was not necessary. So they simply turned it off and then there was no more sound coming in. So having people in front, personnel in front of the stage is something that is not uh, desirable in terms of wanting to mitigate noise capture. Uh, and if you're going to have the volume control or brain bar, uh, the bad team, in front, then you're going to want them to have a remoted system, KVM switches, things like that. You don't want them to have computers and other noise generators uh, right there. It's better to have it in a computer room anyway. It's better for the equipment and it's better for the noise factor. Uh, mitigating stage noise also, uh, what they uh, were, I'm talking with some panel uh, groups and uh, there aren't a lot of uh, fans being used on this side panel because they're heavier, they are able to put heat sinks, but on the ceiling ones, they can put fans on there. So um, it's uh, something to consider. It, I think that there's an opportunity to capture data on stages and offer a, uh, a measurement so that they would understand how reverberant a given stage is, and then realize that they would have to work hard to mitigate it. Or Maybe they're gonna shoot a scene that doesn't require uh, dialogue and then it wouldn't matter. Um, or maybe it's quiet enough where they don't need too much mitigation. You know, if they don't have a ceiling or if they have other uh, design features that make it so that the sound is less reverberant, then it's good to know. And it would be a selling point for uh, when you're recording quiet dialogue. So mitigating and production, um, if everyone's on board, there's a little bit of a challenge because uh, working on the show, you get 
the camera people, there's this hierarchy that's been around for a few decades where camera has priority, lighting has priority. So it's very difficult for sound to be able to uh, occupy the space necessary to mitigate sound. Um, this is something that we built uh, up on the show with uh, some panels. So it's basically uh, at 12 by 12. It's very, very tall. And we use furnished blankets and uh, you can use duvetine to be lighter. And we use a lot of uh, duvetine, sorry, use duvetine and floor mats. So we had furniture blankets all over the place, anything, any, all over the floor, anything that we could cover that was not in the picture that might bounce sound around. We covered it with floor, uh, with uh, furniture blankets. And then we had floor mats, a few floor mats to where actors or crew were walking, they could walk and uh, you know, not trip over the, the blankets. And then we had foam that you could stuff in in different places uh, and then taping it all down, of course. Uh, and so it's the standard mitigation uh, materials, but you just need a lot more of it when you're on a virtual production uh, volume stage. This is something that I, I created um, having read uh, a lot about different acoustical uh, devices. Um, there's a, a box that you can make um, that's sort of like a, a, a wine case that's cut in half. So I saw this uh, honeycomb uh, grid filter that wasn't being used in a, it's a six by six. So we built up a frame and put it on there and wrapped this furniture blanket around it. And this was very effective. Um, I was, uh, I had no idea what it was gonna do, but after, uh, after implementing it, uh, I was very pleased with what it brought. There are other commercial um, opportunities out there too. This is a zero reflection screen uh, by uh, Delta H Designs Incorporated. Um, this was used on Mandalorian. We're also using here on our show too. We had nine of them that were donated for uh, for use, and uh, it's a ZR screen. And it the the designer describes it as using uh, quantum uh, quantum physics principles to convert the uh, wave energy of sound to uh, particle and then uh, dissipate its energy. So he doesn't say that it absorbs sound. Um, he just says that it uh, dissipates the uh, energy. Uh, placement of these materials. This is where you know having the materials and then having uh, the opportunity to bring it up. It's it's uh, difficult because there's the reflections that a camera obviously would like to capture from the LED volume uh, onto the actor. That's why you're there in part, and so. Uh, placing this in a, placing your materials in a way where you're not imposing on the lighting, not imposing on the camera crew, not imposing on crew members, not blocking the the reflection. Uh, it makes it really difficult. So um, I think other uh, solutions will come. Um, I'm actually talking with some people about uh, translucent uh, mitigation elements, which would allow the reflections to come through. Again, the placement. So you can see that we had furniture uh, pads there, and then these are the VR screens around there. We had nine of them, we used all of them. And if we didn't have, uh, if we couldn't get them up close, we, we'd put them against near the uh, LED wall so that the sound couldn't bounce back. So we were not only just interested in the sound not leaving and bouncing around, but also any sound that did get out, not returning. Um, we look back at the uh, large uh, 12 by 12, we angled it up to uh, also deflect it, not only by absorbing it, but by deflecting the sound up. Uh, Post-production's role in this. So there are reverberation removal uh, software tools. Um, uh, the most popular right now is Isotopes uh, RX. I think RX9 is the version, it may change, but uh, they have uh, a uh, D-verb um, plugin and it's very effective. Um, up to a certain amount of reverb. Um, I, I believe between 1.6 and a 1.8 uh, RT60 value, which is the, uh, the time it takes for sound to decay 60 dB. If it decays within that range, uh, post-production can uh, normally address it uh, by using this plugin and then putting a little bit of background fill to, uh, to mask it. So uh, there, post production does play a role. So the goal here on the set is not to uh, mitigate it to the point where the audio is completely clean and it's going to make it all the way to the mix stage, but to get it clean enough to where the 
uh, post-production uh, uh, sound editors and sound mixers can, uh, can uh, get it all the way the rest of the way. The result was that when we did all of this um, on the show that we were working on, 90% of the production di dialogue made it all the way to final mix. That's a pretty high number. I, I, I think that number is really higher than traditional uh, sound recordings on a, on a production. And I think that has to do with the fact that everybody was on board on trying to capture clean dialogue, starting from the director, the producers, and um, the camera crew was then also made to be on board. And uh, I would say 95% of the time, uh, they were very helpful. A couple of times, they, you know, a little stressed out. The 10% that we had to use ADR was because of standard issues where the microphone made too much noise or um, there was a tussling between actors uh, or it was just too loud. It was uh, had to be redone. So the ADR that was done was not because of reverberance, but because of uh, their standard issues that require an ADR. So I, I feel that final sample was achieved in this uh, in this case. So whereas the picture was aiming for a final uh, pixel, we aimed for a final sample and succeeded. So how do we know what all this is going on and what's going on uh, behind uh, the scenes in terms of uh, what's measurable, what's empirical? So what you see here is a picture of a, a spherical array microphone and it has cameras on it. That's what I used to capture that initial sound that you saw bouncing around from a balloon pop uh, and also the noise. Uh, this technology came from aerospace and the automotive industry. It's used to find a mechanical vibration that will indicate that there is an issue that needs to be resolved, um, and uh, you know by the, uh, the, the mechanical designers, the engineers. Um, uh, when I saw this and I found out what it could do, I brought it into our space so that it can make it a lot easier than than the traditional ways of recording and finding what the uh, reverberance was of a given space uh, rather than having to take several days to do it um, i was able to do it in in an hour um, this thing is very very uh, powerful and the interface is pretty easy to, to use um, and it recorded the uh the decay time so the rt60 value so with no mitigation on that stage we had a 3.2 second rtc rt60 value that's equivalent to you know almost a cathedral, uh, not quite, but but getting there. And when we did uh, apply the mitigation and pop a balloon, it dropped it down to 1.4. And again, 1.4 is something that uh, post production can deal with. Um, I have been on stages that had a, an R, a RT uh, 60 value of you know 1.6, 1.7 uh, without any mitigation. Um, and but they uh, tend to not have ceilings and uh, they have you know a large open space it's not uh, in front a large opening so that the sound can escape uh also there's a uh, another measurement another metric it's speech transmission index the speech transmission uh, index you the larger the number the better and what this measures is how clear is speech uh in, a, in an environment and in a reverberant environment you can still hear and understand what people are saying, you just notice that it's it's reverberant. So um, you can still hear people talk in a uh, uh, in a volume stage and understand what they're saying. But with the mitigation, it makes it even that much clearer. The scale is between uh, zero and one on the STI. What is the solution? I mean, it's simple. It's like everything else that we do in our industry, right? It's uh, it's education you know, getting the word out. That's why I'm very comfortable with um, this being recorded and shared. Um, you know, my goal in this uh, and ETC is to um, awaken the industry to the, the problem and to solutions and get people interested in, in doing this. And again, it starts with the producers and the directors because of the top down uh, requirement. And they need to understand the cost benefit of having uh, zero ADR versus ADR. And they need to understand that there's going to be additional personnel, one person, maybe two, and that you're going to want to have people, uh, professionals, uh, sound professionals in the previous phase, uh, previous phase, uh, and a mitigation person in a production phase. And then there's additional equipment and devices. Um, 
depending on what you get, it's not, it doesn't have to be crazy. Uh, you know, you saw the, the do it yourself thing that I did. Uh, that's not expensive. And there's also uh, the commercial one, which is a little bit more expensive. And then it's also having and requiring that there's interdepartmental communication, that everyone is on the same page and understanding the value uh, to the production of capturing a production dialogue and then letting the sound people know what's going on, what the setup is going to be, where the lights are going to be so the sound mitigation crew can come in and, and set up. Um, I actually was the one doing uh, most of the labor in this, and uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, arduous. Um, and you know you're going as quickly as you can so that you're not the reason why camera's not rolling. And then it's going into every production uh, area, every um, every department. You know, starting with previous artists and then production designers, letting everyone know that they have a role. You know, rather than maybe use uh, uh, a wood, maybe leather would be better. Uh, maybe you can use things that have foam in them, uh, using foam objects as opposed to uh, the the real objects that might be metal, you know, just finding ways, costume designers, as we saw before. Production sound mixers need to be educated um, as well, uh, understanding what tools are available to them beyond their normal set of tools and experience. Camera lighting and gaffers and grips need to understand what setups are going to go. This helps in previous. If in previous we were to mock up the mitigation elements, then people would see where they would be placed and it could be placed in uh, collaboration with uh, picture and, and uh, you know, lighting and camera so that everyone understands it's going to be there and not to be surprised and annoyed. Um, assistant directors are very helpful in this regard, uh, making sure that we have the time and space to do what we're doing. Um, and of course, LED volume stage managers uh, need to know that we're going to be doing this. And then post-production, learning what the tools are and getting training to use them better. The tools are only as good as the artist. And uh, I think there's an opportunity to um, teach post-production sound editors uh, how best to use the tools. Um, they sort of, everyone, editors sort of keeps their little secrets and it would be great to find um, someone who would share an effective uh, procedure. Future solutions around, uh, that are coming around the corner, um, uh, I'm hoping for these is um, creating sound tools uh, in the previous. So, you know, much like we have already the cameras and the lighting tools, you know, makes and models, you can put a, a Venice camera in here with, uh, you know, Fujian lens if you want to. And, um, but, you know, where's your microphone? You know, you can put your lights up there, but where's your mitigation panel? Uh, so this is an opportunity I, I see in the future to be able to introduce this to the previous space. And then also including the uh, sound professionals in this uh, previous phase. Uh, making more custody friendly volume uh, stages. You know, if you want to have a ceiling uh, for obvious reasons to have the reflections and whatnot, you know, maybe we can make them so that they open up. I, this is just a concept I created on the fly, a Venetian blind effect uh, would allow sound to, to go away. And also the angle of the panels in a way where the image quality would be better captured by the camera as well. So it's a sort of a, a double win on that. Um, there's also, a, a, there's many other opportunities here. You can make it so that the, the panels are in a, a different uh, uh, angles and whatnot to diffuse the sound as well. Um, there's also uh, image-based lighting can help. So that maybe instead of ceilings, um, they could use uh, image-based lighting to have an effect. Here's uh, something that's uh, using tubes, and that would allow sound to go right through it. Uh, it wouldn't reflect it, and you, could, you might have some of the reflection that you're looking for. Again, this is no, there's no silver bullet in mitigating sound, and, and this isn't to say that you would eliminate ceilings because there's absolutely uh, smart times to use a, a ceiling. But um, when it comes to um, opportunities and having options, this is just another option. Um, if the stages were built in a in a shape of a conical frustum, um, that would that little bit of angle would allow it to bounce out. The, the problem is that this is a um, this this is not easy to build. And since there's already not a lot of stages, you know, relative to the number of LED panel manufacturers that are out there, um, the uh, it's going to be hard to get someone to use these compound curves and whatnot. But 
um, I foresee uh, in the future uh, curtains being used. You know, a translucent curtain might create the same effect. And here is a uh, microphone technology that's uh, just coming out. This, this this is a prototype, and they just came out in production like a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, 80 acoustical sensors. And what this is going to allow uh, people to do is you'll have 80 channels of audio, and you'll be able to pick out the best ones. You're able to focus the beam on a given area. And then uh, not only are you capturing the dialogue, but you're also capturing the ambient, which you can either remove instantly from the uh, from that, or you could um, uh, capture the, the ambient sound that then could be edited out. Now, this isn't really going to get rid of reflection, you know, this ambient part of it, uh, because it's, 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 it's dialogue. It's, it's, you know, you're not going to cut that out. But what you're able to do is, is sort of focus the beam narrower and narrower and then take the better tracks. Uh, I think acoustic, the uh, array microphones, I think eventually in the next 10 years are going to really transform how sound is captured in not only volume stages, but in traditional stages. I imagine they're gonna be placed all over the stage and on props and whatnot. And then AI is going to sort out and create isolated tracks uh, per actor. Um, so I see, I see that as the future. Um, and then here's the monitoring devices. You know, you have the ability to, uh, see where your noise is originated from. There's a 3D camera that I was using. There's also a, TV, a 2D uh, uh, option as well. This would be a great way to survey the stage to find out where the noise generators are and or you could you know, pop a balloon and find out where it's bouncing from uh, from the standpoint of the actor and then mitigate it, either moving set pieces or uh, you know, doing or putting something in front of it to uh, either deflect it or uh, uh, absorb it. So again, the most important ways to, to mitigate sound is to have a top-down directive and then uh, to support and guard the dialogue. And then this needs to be carried out through previous to post. And that's it. That's the, that's the, uh, that's all my information. That's all I got. So anyone with any questions or uh, concerns, uh, now's a good time to raise them. Uh, this is Paul. I have, I have a question. Is there any research going into um, modifying the LED panels themselves to be more absorbent, so the very source of the reflection is is part of the mitigation. Well, there's there's a couple of options. Uh, uh, one is that there's talk of putting micro cones in between the pixels. Um, another was to do a sort of a laser uh, burst, a hole through the glass that's in front or the plastic in front, so that the sound could enter and have a hard time uh, escaping. Um, but, uh, and there's no real talk about, you know, making a softer surface or anything like that. Um, I, uh, I honestly think that, you know, with panel manufacturers, uh, the best that we're going to hope for is make sure that they're quiet. And then I think it's uh, up to uh, other technologies such as a uh, a curtain, a translucent curtain, and uh, lighter mitigation elements. Um, I foresee mitigation elements being uh, sort of a combination light and sound mitigation tool. Um, I, I see something, because you know, you're competing for space, and the closer you can get the mitigation to the actor, the better the result. So uh, were we to have uh, and light has the priority. Lighting has the priority. So if I can make the lighting elements also acoustical elements, then I would, uh, I think I would have a really good result. But not, not so much the panel manufacturers. And, and <clears throat> I'm sorry. So you make a really compelling case here for for the audio treatment of these volumes. Are production companies actually paying attention to this? When I mean, you mentioned they've got to get into previs, and there's no previs tools per se. I mean, are the production companies getting into it? Are the the manufacturers getting into it? Um, and no, uh, what, what I, what I'm seeing is that I find that a lot of, and I know I don't, I haven't been on every show by, by any means, but my, my sense is that, um, a lot of features and whatnot, they're not doing their homework. They're not doing the previs as they should, so even just for the picture side of things, you know, some, um, Production, uh, virtual production isn't for every type of director. They have different ways of working and it's not always conducive. The technology isn't always conducive to every style of, of, of creation. And so um, 
and they're having a hard time just, I think the industry's having a hard time just getting qualified people to do the tasks that are supposed to do and, um, and organize it in a constructive way where they have the buy-in that's necessary in order to make virtual production a success. So even with the um, ICVFX, they're challenged. So even to add on that, the sound side of things, um, it's, it's not as common. I think there's too much of a um, acceptance uh, to use ADR. Um, when I, before I started my study, when I was asking people and told them what I was gonna do, the comments I would hear, well, we have ADR. You know, what's the problem with ADR? Why don't we do ADR? And uh, so there's, uh, you know, a uh, not always an appreciation and, and an understanding of the value of original performance dialogue. So if you don't hold production dialogue uh, value to it, then you're not going to spend any energy. Even though, even if you took that part out of it, it's less expensive to capture the, the original dialogue cleanly than it is to go through ADR. So, uh, and it's, I mean, you know, for lack of a better thing, it's also a smaller carbon footprint because you're not having to have to fly the uh, actor out and do all of that good stuff. And, you know, a lot of actors want to just do it on their iPhone uh, and that's not good enough. And so, um, but to your, to your question, no, I, I don't, I don't see uh, uh, anyone rushing to, uh, to address this. Um, and so that's why I'm eager. I'm so appreciative of this opportunity to speak to your group. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm evangelizing this to, to some degree. So. Uh, and uh, oh, this is going to sound like a really weird question, and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, landmine you here, but you know, with the, the whole issue on ADR, as you mentioned, is you know, you either get the actor to try and come in again and capture the feeling that they had during the presentation, or you get uh, a voice model, for want of a better word, to replace the actor and, and do that kind of work. Um, I think many of us have just seen the deep fake Leo DiCaprio speech uh, that, that was given where they replaced his his voice with a, a, a deep fake replacement. Is that something that, that the, the industry is looking at, which would, to some degree, I'm afraid, um, diminish the need for the mitigation you're talking about on site? Is that something people are looking at? You know, and I, I, I don't know. I imagine there's people over, you know, at NVIDIA and places like that, um, that I would imagine, yes, they are. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. Just, but just my, um, my, my, I guess it's more my belief, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a scientific thing, but it's just my belief that it's difficult to replicate the emotion of the human voice uh, in, in any fashion, even when the actor themselves is doing it and doing their best to replicate what they did earlier, sometimes six months earlier or a year earlier. Um, I, I just think that being a real fan of sound and hearing sound on, on you know, in, in a nice stage, um, there's so much emotion and a connection that the audience will have with the character and the feeling of the moment if that is protected and, and carried all the way through. Um, that said, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's, it's, there's money involved and time and, and, and all of that. And so uh, sometimes it's good enough is good enough, you know. Um, okay. you know I get that too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, totally understood. Uh, for the audience in general, if you have any questions, you can feel free to come and ask them or post them in the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we'll push, push them on to Eric. We actually have a question here from Gil for you, Eric. Okay, you touched on it. You touched on it briefly, but um, talking about um, acoustic audio engineers, and part of their job would be to pick the right microphone, and also the proper microphone position, and then also that the talent is aware of any of those microphone characteristics. Say it has a proximity effect, or if it's we've all seen that person not talking into the microphone and fading and coming and going, but education on that. But is there a lot done on that end also? You know, my my understanding and my, the little bit of experience I had is that uh, the sound person doesn't get to call any of those shots in terms of, you know, where the actor goes. They have to react to it. And that's what the rehearsal's for. I think um, uh, where the, 
where I see the, uh, the acoustician playing a role in the previs is making sure that the sets are more acoustically friendly, the costumes are more acoustically friendly, um, in, in the materials that are used, the, the geometry of them, um, how, you know, you could also talk about how, where is the actor standing on the stage? There are areas that are less reverberant than others. If the actor is, you know, back to the wall, but facing toward the opening of the stage, uh, that dissipates the energy because the energy goes out to the open space. Um, and these are, these are things where they're very visible when you're making a, uh, virtual pre-visualization or prototype production. Um, you're able to see the placement of the set pieces and the actor, uh, the intended on the stage. And you would be able to say, well, if we shifted this over, would that work? You know, could we do that? And if we could, it's going to save us something. So um, I think that's where the acoustician would come into place. I, I think, you know, the microphones and, and whatnot, they might wind up changing their mind on the fly anyway. There's always that creative, um, and you don't, want to, you don't want to quell the creative flow where someone wants to change it and they want to move it around or, or whatnot. So, yeah, I don't see so much of, of training the actor because it's just, you know, maybe some are pros that aiming their voice in a certain direction, but... Um, I don't see as much of a focus in that in that direction. All right. Um, we did have one person who was looked like they were going to ask a question, but I don't at, at the moment see the question in the Q&A. Um, for the sake of expediency, um, what I'll do is I'll take that under advisement and send you the question, if that's okay with you, Eric, and then we can get the answer to the, the person asking. Um, of course, and I hope this is helpful. I hope this is interesting. I, I find this this subject really interesting myself, and um, obviously, I spent a year and a half working on it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally find it fascinating. Many of us are closet audiophiles, uh, <laughs> anyway. So, uh, I, I mean, the idea of the the um, the, the spherical camera was um, astounding. <laughs> I just blew. How how um, you said that you brought that in it's been used in other industries. Is that a massively expensive piece of game? I mean, and there's a, a, a sort of price question stopping that coming in. Yeah, that that one, that one with uh, everything in, you know, for a year's support and everything like that is around like seventy one, seventy two thousand dollars. And oh, then um, 72,000. So, and then the other one, the, uh, the uh, 2D one is around 40 something thousand dollars. And they are making another one that's going to be around $20,000. So, um, they're getting, they're getting it down. I am, I imagine someday, maybe five years from now or so, it'll be on your phone and you'll hang the device and you'll be using the software, you know, wirelessly. And uh, sending up the file, and it might take a little bit long, but the price point would be a lot uh, less. The, the reason why it's so expensive is uh, that all those microphones have to be calibrated and that software, and not a lot of people buy it. So you have these PhDs working on these uh, on, on this technology, and it's not enough. Um, the auto industry and the space industry is they use it, but uh, like SpaceX uses it, Tesla uses it, and. Uh, but it's you know they're they're one offs. Takes three months to make one. So. Oh. Okay. And and uh, some of the question has actually come in. Um, our question is asking about frequency dependent absorption. Do you use any tools that are uh, absorbent at different frequencies as opposed to just a large moving um, um, panels, which pretty much absorb everything you throw at them, right? Right. Um, you know, I think with the dialogue range is from uh, six hundred to thirty one. 100 hertz if i remember correctly um and that's uh uh that's uh, no uh, to uh, no i the one we use right now we just threw whatever we had at it and 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 it worked but i um there are materials that i people have been talking to me about materials and and proposals and i think that that would be more uh frequency uh directed you know focused on that dialogue range because that's what you want to protect is the dialogue range right. and right. usually when people are talking though there's no there's no other sounds i mean there's no other sounds anyway so you know why would you want to capture anything you know other than the dialogue okay and uh there is another question that's come from the same individual i'm just trying to 
Uh, my comment is the evolutionary origin of human face recognition and voice emotional attention. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. It sounds uh, it sounds like you're talking about uh, facial capture and yeah. um, uh, and then also uh, you know and, and the voice. You know, I again, you know, I um, I think the AI technology is amazing, and I think. Uh, a lot uh, passes through it, but I think when you're talking about a very emotional scene, and there are scenes when it wouldn't matter, you know, people are in war and they're and they're they're running across the field. Okay, maybe it doesn't matter, but when someone's dying in your hands, you know, or and there's the last words, you might want that to be really dialed in, you know. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not it's not cookie cutter. It's not one size fits all, and it's not there's no silver bullet. You know, it's it's a creative choice. Well, listen, this has been, from my perspective, a very interesting, enlightening and educational presentation, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. If any other questions do come in, uh, I'll forward them to you, and then we'll try and get those answers uh, back to the individuals who are asking them. Um, but I'd like to thank you for the, your presentation from the uh, Simti Sacramento chapter, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again at some time. I hope so, and I really, I really appreciate it. I mean, just so you know, the other things I, I can talk about are um, digital infrastructure to support uh, all of this, you know, all of the things that we do to bring data industry standards there. And I'm also uh, now an instructor uh, of virtual production. I've, I've spent a month in London working with MOSIS, and they've trained me to be a virtual production instructor to teach people uh, the overall process and then specific things. So. There's opportunities for speaking again, not just about sound, but other things, because um, I have more than one interest. Well, you may you may regret mentioning that, Eric, just but we may well take you up on that. I hope you do. I, I, it's a pleasure, Paul. And thanks for being so good about keeping me on track and making well, sure I had everything I needed. So it's very good. It, it, the pleasure's been all mine. Thanks a lot, Eric. Take care. Bye-bye, guys.